But producing the content, you know, it's rare that I see a lot of the partners in those bigger firms featured. The companies are not personalized. They're, they're sterile corporate images off to the to and afar. What's your elevator pitch, right? Gary asked me when he interviewed me, describe what you do in one sentence. And I said, I take dreams and visions and I make them into action plans. And he said, great, you're hired. I got a lot of dreams and visions. Broad headlines that make people stop and say, wow, I, I need that. Uh, you know, I need tax savings advice. Uh, you know, I, I need financing. You know, let me, let me see how these guys can help us. We've served up over 650 clean audits in the last 24 months. You know, something that's compelling that you can hang a hat on that will stop somebody and, uh, in their tracks because th that spoke to them. That is what they need at that moment in time. I think that's how accountants can stay in their swim lane and be a little more comfortable. Stick with the facts. Hey guys, welcome to CPA Primetime. Today, we have a very special guest and I just wanna let him take the mic quickly, but James Orsini, I think this will actually be an interesting interview for you. I don't know how many podcasts you've done where the audience actually knows much, much more about KPMG and Goldman Sachs than they know about uh, VaynerMedia and Gary Vaynerchuk. So uh, this, this, this should be very interesting. But um, without further to do, I would like to let you talk a little bit about where you started your career and up till now. And since you, ha since you have so much experience, uh, feel free to you know, take the mic and speak on your journey. Great, thanks so much, Juan. Looking forward to, uh, uh, to finding a common chord with your audience. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go way back, gonna go old school. Um, born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, son of a plumber, and I went to Seton Hall University where I majored in accounting. There you go. I had a, a, a very nice uh, audit teacher, John Dan, who, who told me, you know what, kid, you should be an auditor. <laughs> um, uh, I was fortunate to have uh, gotten an internship uh, in my junior year there, and uh, it was funny. I interviewed with, with then all of the big, uh, big eight and decided to go with number nine, which was actually Maine Herdman at the time. So I'm going way back. Interesting. And merged into uh, KPMG. Uh, but I had a great internship and um, was one that uh, they offered a job uh, uh, in my uh, junior year. So uh, it was good to know that uh, in senior year, um, I knew exactly where I was going. And I was going to uh, the Park Avenue Plaza building in New York City. Um, and uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked the company. I liked the people. Um, I liked the clients that I had, uh, which uh, I will circle back to Sasha Group because there was something unique about Maine Herdman clients. There was a whole middle tier of clients that, that this company really owned. Um, hmm. What he was really focusing on, uh, United Merchants and Manufacturers and, uh, and Jonathan Logan and, and companies like that. Uh, sure, we had big ones like, like Pfizer and uh, the city of New York at the time. First time we had done the single audit act back then. I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but I had a good, uh, good time there. Um, uh, went up through the ranks quickly um, and uh, uh, wound up, uh, I, wrote, I wrote an article about my internship changed my life because I uh, actually wound up meeting my wife there. She worked uh, on a job uh, with me. Uh, we're still happily married now, and uh, truth be told, uh, uh, my son works for KPMG today. So, oh wow! Yeah, he uh, he's not on the accounting side; he's in the uh, uh, debt securitization uh, side, which uh, you know is more on the management consulting side. But yet, he is in the hallways. Right. Um, so Joanne went on to uh, to do things uh, on the uh, on the tax side. Uh, and I decided that uh, I was going to chase some money and go to Wall Street because that's what guys did in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I was actually on a pilot program, interestingly enough, where they hired uh, five two-year CPAs to marry up in a cubicle with Wharton MBAs. No experience. So that was their typical hiring, Wharton MBAs, no experience. And they put us in these cubicles with these guys, five of us. Um, and uh, fortunately, uh, 
it was successful and the hiring practice remains in effect today. Uh, and I, um, uh, I was uh, an analyst uh, on the uh, J. Aaron Commodities trading side, the investment banking side. And I stood there for a couple of years and I knew that, uh, you know, Wall Street really wasn't for me. Mm. Uh, I was fortunate when I was at KPMG that one of my clients uh, was a Saatchi and Saatchi subsidiary, mm -hmm. Siegel and Gale, which was in the branding space. And I remember uh, sitting in the cubicle outside the CEO's office and thinking to myself, I could see myself here someday. This is the, this is the type of creative environment that I want to be around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I just kind of dog-eared it and didn't do much uh, with it, you know, um, other than, uh, you know, a little aspirational dream. Mm -hmm. And I got a call one day when I was at Goldman Sachs from, from the manager that I worked for at KPMG. And he said, listen, I'm over at Saatchi and Saatchi. And the Saatchi brothers just bought a single public relations firm in New York City. Mm -hmm. And they create a worldwide company. And someday, if you leave Goldman Sachs, someday you'll be the CFO of that company. Um, so that was not what guys were doing in the 80s. Guys were not okay. Goldman Sachs. They were staying right there. Um, but I took the shot uh, and I did leave. And um, fortunately, within five years, we built the fifth largest public relations firm in the world. And I uh, was a global CFO before I was 30, overseeing uh, 31 offices in 26 countries. Wow. So that came, that came really good. I stayed there uh, for about a dozen years and, uh, and then decided, uh, uh, actually, Saatchi was acquired by Publicis at the time. And I figured, you know what, I'm going to have some new bosses anyway. Why don't I pick my bosses rather than be told these are your bosses? Mm -hmm. So I went to work uh, for a company called Interbrand, uh, which is owned by Omnicom, branding company. I was their global CFO for four years um, and then decided that um, uh, I didn't want to be a CFO anymore. Um, Interesting. I, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I always, so I, I am a CPA, I've been an auditor. I've been a controller, I've been a CFO, but I always kind of felt deep down that I was a much better businessman than I ever was accountant. Um, and I wanted to try something different. And, and they said, uh, don't leave, you know, we'll do something here for you. And they created a North American chief operating officer role. Uh, and they put me up with, uh, with a then president in North America. And together we were the office of the CEO. Awesome. Uh, that's really what, what started um, my sort of operational acumen uh, in this uh, uh, marketing communication space that I've been in for the past uh, 25 plus years. Right, uh, right. So um, um, we were hugely successful in the first 18 months. We grew revenue by 20%, profits by 60%, picked up four margin points. So uh, that caught the attention of, uh, believe it or not, Saatchi and Saatchi, where I'd worked before. And um, they called back. I recognized the caller ID. Uh, and um, uh, they say, hey, man, can you do what you're doing over there, back over here, but this time in the main advertising agency? Uh, and I said, uh, yeah, I said, uh, I can. So um, the, the, then the Saatchi New York office was, was about three times the size of Interbrand's North American operation. Uh, so I went there and I did that for five years and um, uh, you know, had a great time doing that and was ready, uh, ready for a change again. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you know, had a couple different opportunities that I was looking at and uh, I, I picked the further stretch. So I became the CEO of a small publicly traded technology company. And I said, great, uh, I've never been a CEO. I don't know anything about technology. I've never really been on the front end of a publicly traded company. This sounds like the right job for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I became the CEO of a company called Cito Mobile, uh, trades on the NASDAQ now, SITO. Uh, I had a three year contract. I stood three and a half years. Uh, it was a hard and lonely job. Um, and I knew what I didn't want to be when I continued growing up. So, uh, uh, so I decided I was going to get back into the big advertising space um, and uh, had a, uh, a few nice offers. And I got a call from uh, AJ Vaynerchuk, Gary's younger brother. Right. 
And he said, hey, James, did you ever meet my brother Gary? And I said, no. He said, did you ever hear my brother Gary? And I said, no. Uh, he said, well, why don't you come in and meet with him? So I spent 15 minutes with him, and I got a call back from AJ, and he said, good news. He likes you. He wants to have dinner with you. <laughs> we spent dinner together. Uh, this was uh, a little over four years ago. And he said, look, I want to build a $500 million integrated, independent, international communications company. Can you help me do it? Um, he said, I want, I want a Richard Edelman model. And I said, yeah. I said, I know Richard Edelman. I had breakfast with him yesterday. So I said, uh, I know that model. I think I could help you. So he's like, great. Don't take those other jobs. Come to work for me. Uh, and that was, uh, that was four years ago. We were 42 million, a little under 400 people. And, and we ended last year about 150 million, a little over 800 people here at VaynerMedia. Awesome. And now I'm the president of... Uh, the Sasha Group has uh, his newly launched uh, division under the VaynerX family. Right, right. And look, um, guys, you might have been familiar with a lot of that, right? A story in the financial sector, um, but maybe some of the audience out there, they're not as familiar with VaynerMedia or the Sasha Group, the new, a new company, right? Of really a different offering, right? So why don't you catch the audience up to speed with what you can say about what VaynerMedia does and what you do now, which is lead the Sasha Group. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so from the marketing perspective, I really started my career in public relations, and then I went to branding, and then I went to general market advertising, and then I went to that technology company, which we moved to a mobile media company. And uh, VaynerMedia, which was run by Gary Vaynerchuk, is, is uh, in the uh, uh, digital agency with social media at its core, predominantly, and, um, uh, you know, advertises on all the social media platforms uh, and really is able to, uh, uh, to handle uh, account and strategy and creative. Uh, it has a production division. Uh, it has a full service media planning and buying division. It has a digital publishing division in the gallery media group. Um, so it, it is a depth and breadth of uh, a marketing services company. Um, and, and most recently, uh, Gary realized that um, he built a company to service a Fortune 500 client base. And he had about 6 million followers in his social media channels. Uh, and he didn't have a product for him. So um, the Sasha Group is, is something that he's been thinking about for several years, and, and the time was right to uh, birth a company that uh, uh, provides education, consulting, and marketing, uh, digital marketing services to smaller companies between $1 million and $100 million in revenue. Right, right. Awesome. No. I love it. And uh, I love uh, Gary Vaynerchuk too. I was talking to him last week, which is how we really got James Orsini on the podcast here. Um, I told Gary Vaynerchuk what I saw in the accounting market. And uh, I was very interested to get you on the podcast and see with you being around VaynerMedia really helped build it, right? What I don't know what type of accounting clients VaynerMedia has had or the Sasha Group is looking at. Uh, what do you see um, from just the accounting industry and the topic of marketing? What before I have my thoughts about it, but you know, what are your thoughts? Well, look, I, I think uh, when you, you the importance of the accounting industry uh, is only escalating in, in the world of transparency and in the world of uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, shareholder uh, uh, protection. Um, one of my biggest uh, um, fears is the independence. How independent can you be if a client is paying you a hundred million dollars to do their audit? You know, uh, do you really want to find something bad <laughs> in that? Audit? I mean, you know, those are big fees uh, to be paying. So um, that's always been a little oxymoronic for me. Same thing with Sarb. That's why I didn't really like. Being a publicly traded company, I couldn't understand. Let me get this straight. If I, if I exceed my earnings by a penny, it will reward it. And if, my, if I miss my earnings by a penny, I'm punished. Um, who's the more honest person in this mix here? The guy who 
fix his earnings every time by a penny or the guy who's willing to tell you that he missed it by the penny. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think the accounting profession um, uh, um, needs to, uh, you know, see itself in, in the lens that we need them to, to be, the, the protectors of those that don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that I actually have an accounting degree because uh, I've held various um, uh, operating and chief uh, type positions, right? And from chief financial to chief administrator to chief integration officer to chief operating officer. I've been, I've been a CEO. I've been a president. So, um, and all of that has become much better and richer because I actually understand the finances of the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great CFO today helps understand, helps the finances enhance the vision of the company rather than choke the vision of the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, now that you're leading the Sasha group, right? How, how would you say that the Sasha group is different than other, you know, let's just say competitors, right? Yeah, so I, I think because we, we uh, um, we're, here's what I found out uh, in, in the last uh, three weeks since we launched this business. It's clear to me that businesses of this size are used to being treated as second class citizens, right? They, they're mm -hmm. in the Colgates and Proctors of this world. Um, uh, they're in the back of the line and we just created a company that moved them to the front of the line. So not only is, is this company, the Sasha Group, infused with entrepreneurial DNA from, from its leader, right? Gary is on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. Mm -hmm. but, but it also has the understanding of servicing Fortune 500s, which is what these brands want to be. So the interesting part about uh, the Sasha Group is our goal is to get them to outgrow the Sasha Group and grow into VaynerMedia. I mean, we're perfect to have them outgrow us. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, clients that, that we service, whether, whether it's a client like Bag Bomb, who's a 120-year-old company out of Vermont, which is a Vaseline-type product, um, or, or uh, Sun Butter, which is a, a, an alternative uh, uh, peanut butter made from sunflower seeds. You know, these are great brands that somebody needed to help them tell the story. And, and we are doing that, you know, uh, and, and helping them to get the explosive growth uh, through uh, through the digital channels where uh, the audiences are and the attention is uh, uh, and uh, it's reasonably priced attention so uh, so by saying you know more compelling stories and more compelling content that the consumer is willing to consume create the awareness um, I mean it was really fun I was just on with uh, a client uh, a plastic surgery client and um, uh, you know, she says, well, can you send me over any, uh, any case studies, any relevant case studies or anything like that to just show me how your creative content is. And uh, one of the ones that we mentioned is Sun Butter. She goes, I can't believe you just said that. I just tried the product last week. I saw a video on Facebook. I tried the product last week. I love it. So I said, well, there you go. I mean, it's game over. Mic drop. There you go. There you go. And one of the things I love that you touched on was um, storytelling, right? And uh, something that my clients are doing, which are entrepreneurial CPAs, entrepreneurial accountants, they're starting to tell a lot of their stories. I just had um, two clients get on a podcast and record over two hours worth of CPAs just having a discussion. And then, man, the, the attraction they got on LinkedIn, the conversations that started because of that, um, there really hasn't been much of that, of course. Um, as there was in the past, right? So storytelling from a Sasha Group perspective and a Vayner Media perspective, I mean, how is that done in, a, in an industry where there's a lot of compliance, like in the accounting industry, where sure, my entrepreneurial CPAs who are a bit, um, they're, they're more charismatic than your usual, than your stereotypical accountant, right? And they're, mm -hmm. more, they're more risk adverse than you know, leaders of the top 100 accounting firms, let's just say, right? Yeah. So in this industry where everyone, where when I might say, you know, why don't you make this their immediate, you know, 
pushback is they start pushing on compliance, right? So how can we storytell in that environment and how, are, how is VaynerMedia's philosophy and the Sasha Group's philosophy around um, these things that people worry about, I guess you would say? Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, so I'm dealing with, with two right now, right? So uh, uh, one, uh, we, we were part of the team that birthed uh, Ameriprise Financial Services when we pulled it out of American Express, you know, and creating that brand out of nothing and really having it stand on its own and resonate with, with people. Um, here at, uh, at Sasha Group, we're servicing um, uh, a three-person uh, or a three-partner uh, uh, insurance agency out of Miami, right? Uh, nothing more regulated and stodgy than insurance. Um, but here's what we did. We leaned on the three partners. Each one had, had a swim lane that they felt comfortable in. One partner started a podcast. Another was doing video on uh, on Instagram, uh, Instagram stories, and uh, and YouTube. In fact, he had a passion for a cartoon, so we brought in a um, a uh, animator who animated him as an animated character, and that's yes. what he goes on. The other partner was very good at writing. He writes long form uh, content for LinkedIn and and Medium posts. Um, and then they take those passions and they bring it back to their business needs, right? Uh, and, it, you know, it, it's a personal, when you're in a service sector business, like accounting or law firm, your assets go down the elevator every night, right? And you hope that they come back because it's just the people. So humanizing the people and creating people that other people feel comfortable working with and, and, and counseling with, you know what I mean? And then creating that network. My financial planner picks up the phone and talks to my attorney who talks to my CPA. That's the other thing that's very important. Mm -hmm. CPA, I've been a CFO. Did you hear what I just said? I have my own financial planner and I have my own tax account. I don't play in the space that's, that's not to my sweet spot. If I'm a second baseman, I'm staying on second base. I'm not going to center field, okay? Let's get somebody else to play center field. So, the accounting profession um, is so desperately needed in a time where we, you know, just changed all the tax laws. It's, it's murky out there, you know, and the ability to, to be able to <clears throat> make sure that, uh, that there's clarity, there's a beacon that is helping people find their way. Um, uh, you know, these companies that are, that are IPOing or, or, uh, or ICOing now, right. And, and, um, initial coin offerings and things like that. Um, <clears throat> just having somebody who can help provide some uh, semblance of, um, of digestible content that the normal person can understand. You know, this is CPAs talking to CPAs, obviously. So yeah. we, we speak our own language, but the masses are not CPAs. Let, let, you know, they're just regular people. So now, how do you get that compelling message to be understood by regular people and have them comfortable to say, you know what, this is the expert that I'm, uh, you know, that I'm going to take their counsel on, and uh, not blindly, but but I'm going to feel good that it's you know it's eighty five percent of where it needs to be, and I'll provide the fifteen percent that personalizes it for me. Mm -hmm. No, I think um, man, the accounting mm -hmm. industry is so important, and that's mm -hmm. why. You know, I just had to jump from PricewaterhouseCoopers to the accounting marketing side because I just think so many accounting brands can have such a better voice in a world where if an account, you talked about new tax changes, right? Things are a bit murky in a world where, you know, someone may be doing some fishy stuff inside of the accounting industry, but if they're marketed really, really well, they can actually be number one, right? Um, I mean, people talk about putting their head down and doing work in a, in a lot of these accounting businesses. You know, they take pride in uh, their results will speak for themselves, right? But at some point, um, you have to show off, show off those results or, or market those results, right? And I felt as if uh, before I came into the industry, before I looked at certain entrepreneurial CPAs and things that I look at now, I felt that the industry had a problem in relaying that value to regular people which are well regular people turn do turn into CEOs and 
decision makers, right? Um, what can you say to how other people that are not accountants or in the accounting industry but need accountants, how would you say that they view accountants? I think that's important. Look, uh, word of mouth has never been as important as it is now. And social media takes the word of mouth and gives it a megaphone, right? Uh, people are more likely to buy a product because a friend recommends it rather than they saw a television commercial uh, uh, playing during the Grammy Awards. So um, don't underestimate word of mouth. Um, in, in fact, uh, I introduced my attorney to my um, financial planner, and now they use the same financial planner. I introduced my financial planner to my accountant, and he's referring people to my accountant. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's words of mouth and, and uh, being able to have a brand that um, is established and looks to be um, one that you can go to for different counsel. So, so what do I mean by that? CPA firms can expand to be many things beyond just, I do your books and records and I handle your taxes, right? So mm -hmm. I, I had a client today whose controller resigned. He's in, he's in Indiana, a commercial installation company in Indiana. And my recommendation to him was, listen, um, is there a local accounting firm that you can use as outsourced CFO type services. You don't have the money for a full-time CFO, nor do you really need a full-time CFO. But there are decisions that you need to make where you need to rub up against somebody who can provide that sort of CFO counsel. And believe me, every controller thinks that they're a CFO, every CFO thinks they're a chief operating officer. And, and you know, there's really different swim lanes for all of these. So, uh, once you find a confidant in, in your accounting firm, in your CPA, you'll go to them more. And, and if they say, hey, this is the insurance agent that you should use, or this is the financial planner that you should use, or this is the bank that you should get your mortgage from, you know, there's a trust factor there. Mm -hmm. Why are you recommending that bank? Because I know how that bank processes the stuff, and I'm going to get your finances in order to make this loan uh, docs uh, quick and speedy. And we'll get through this process quick, you know. So, the you know, looking for good advice and counsel that is trusted mm -hmm. can lean on your CPA for. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I know I do that all the time, and I know when to raise my hand to say I'm not the right one to give you that advice, but I know somebody who can. Right, right. No, and on that same topic of kind of you making introductions, word of mouth, uh, making recommendations. I actually recommended that one of my clients should spend $10,000 on the four D's. Right. And they kind of didn't know what I was talking about. This is a, um, this is a crypto tax software client. Okay. And I think they have a, had a great opportunity, but, um, if you wouldn't, and I think at that time when I advised them to go ahead and take that opportunity, I think it was, uh, still at Vayner media, um, the Sasha group had not been launched and uh, it was $10,000 at the time. But if you could talk about the four D's and educate our audience on that offering. Yeah, uh, that was interesting. Um, and I was, I was there when that came about um, when Gary said, Hey, you know what? Um, I, I want a Zappos or a Disney sort of day in the life uh, where people can come in and digest exactly uh, how we go about providing the services that we do. So we rotate in senior leaders from media, uh, strategy, influencer marketing, uh, you know, e-commerce, creative, uh, to, to um, go through. Um, it's a combination education workshop, I think would be the best way to say it. So the classes are small. They, they hold about 12 people. Um, and uh, it's a full day. It's a full day of immersion. Uh, so, you know, you, you come out really brain drained. Um, uh, Gary does come into, uh, into each session for at least an hour or so, hour and a half. So everyone around that table does get to ask a pointed question about their particular business to him. And, uh, you know, it's a diverse, eclectic group. It could be real estate agents. It could be um, sports figures. It could be brand managers. 
Um, it was mega church pastors who were trying to get more congregants, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's all about garnishing attention and how do I get the attention that I need for the people to buy my flowers or to consume my cereal bar, you know, or to come into my insurance company or to buy my furniture, you know, it, it's really all over the place. So we've had about 300 clients come through now. Um, in fact, we're developing other educational uh, offerings because um, many of them are said, hey, what's next? Like, I'm, I'm happy I spent. I, I was talking to a, um, uh, a lumber yard in, uh, 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 where were they? They were in the Rocky, uh, Rocky Mountains, Colorado. And they said they were growing well before the 4Ds, okay? 21% uh, per month, but post the 4Ds and applying what it was that they learned in that room, they're growing 32% per month now. So, mm. You know, on, on a $24 million business, he said the 4Ds, and, and they brought two guys. So, you know, that, that was more like 20 grand rather than 10. Um, the 4Ds has more than paid for itself in the first few months. Uh, and we have a lot of case studies, you know, like that, 40% uh, increased sales, uh, you know, September to September, 300% increase in uh, um, Black Friday sales, uh, you know, post, uh, post learning. So um, it's, uh, it, that's the educational component of what is now uh, part of uh, the Sasha group, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we have a consulting component where we actually work with uh, small businesses that are between two and 25 million that are mature, have been around for a while and are simply stuck and, and stuck CPA terms means can't get past 10 million, can't, you know, can't grow more than 2% a year, can't get more 4% profit margin. Or, uh, a $25 million uh, commercial uh, uh, corporate supply company that pro provides uh, um, snacks and coffees can't get past a 2.5% margin in an industry that should average 8 to 10%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how do we help them unlock that explosive growth? Right, right. And I'm just taking uh, a guess here. I'm just assuming, but does a lot of that have to, have to do with uh, speed and content creation? A lot of this well, growth... Um, you know, in, in, the, in the mentor segment that we provide, the consulting arm, it's not just marketing solutions. I mean, there could be culture initiatives. You know, Gary's really big on culture and empathy. Uh, you know, he calls it the honey empire here. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a less than 10% voluntary turnover rate in an industry that averages 30%. So we're doing something right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be cu cultural component, could be CEO coaching. Uh, certainly, there's uh, digital marketing and uh, um, uh, uh, you know marketing solutions that are provided. Um, the organizational structure could be uh, flipping direct to consumer. We had a uh, a twenty million dollar uh, nail polish manufacturer that was selling what they did directly to a professional licensed cosmetologists, and we flipped their business to go direct to consumer. So. So that resulted in, oh my God, my warehouse now has to do fulfillment, returns and whatnot. But, you know, um, this guy's business changed, changed overnight. We had a licensing uh, client out of uh, Florida that was, you know, spending their time, 95% of their business was through big box, uh, you know, Walmarts, Kmarts, uh, uh, Auto Zones. And our instruction was you need to flip that in three years where 95% of your business is direct to consumer through online. We'll help them, you know, build out Shopify e-commerce sites and uh, things that allow them to sell to the consumer. Okay, mm -hmm. now what did that do? Well, that taxed their business because, oh my God, now we need several million dollars to actually stock the inventory. Before what was happening is we right. purchased order from Walmart we, we'd use that to go to the manufacturer to then build the, the product. And, you know, we didn't have to float all that stuff in between. And now if you're going direct to consumer, your guy's not going to wait six weeks until you get this thing manufactured. You better have this somewhere in a warehouse so you can ship it in 48 hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he had to go to his accountants to then get the business valued, uh, you know, do a business valuation which then allowed him to, to try and secure the proper funding to allow him to secure the inventory to transition the business to direct to consumer. Wow. Wow. And, um, you know, something you said earlier was that you were, or you have always been a business person first 
and then an accountant second, right? Or that's how you um, kind of felt, right? So speaking to just building big businesses, being COO at VaynerMedia, um, what do you think is the most important infrastructure um, to set around people within a business? Because 800 people is a lot of people to, uh, to, to end up with after you went in when it was 400 people, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, look, any service sector company, the biggest cost is the employees, right? And monitoring a staff cost to fee ratio is something that I've always uh, leaned heavily on. Nice. Uh, you know, um, I, I run my businesses on job cost profitability, labor utilization, client realization, things like that. Uh, real estate is another big component to keep our eyes on. So, you know, uh, uh, some of these service sector companies, your, your staff cost to fee ratio should uh, be probably somewhere between 50 and 55 percent. Your rent should really not exceed four or five percent of the net revenue, you know. Uh, yeah, and you're trying to target a profit margin north of 15 percent if you can, you know. So, um, this is kind of what I use as the levers, but they are all uh, gauges on a dashboard, right? So, uh, so you can't just look at the gas and not keep your eye on the oil and the water. You blow the car up, right? So one of the things that, that I've uh, uh, worked with Gary over the last four years is helping him to uh, purpose for profits, right? Meaning we're, we're setting out to be profitable. We're not going to look in the rearview mirror and say, how did we do? Okay. Uh, you know, and then justify the results that we did because we realized, holy shit, we didn't make a lot of money. Okay, um, being able to to purpose for profitability, and that's part of what I promised here early on, is that you know the Sasha Group will be one of the fastest growing, most profitable divisions in the Banner X portfolio. So, you know, it's a big and lofty promise, mm -hmm. but um, uh, you know, I, I know what I'm capable of. Most importantly, I know how passionate he is about the success of this division. So, you know, uh, he he will be. Uh, ringing the bell often to to make sure that you know that the the new business pipe is full, um, and my job is to you know use the fifty plus people that I have here today to service this profitably, not not over service businesses that are here. Uh, we use it efficiently. Um, you know, there's there's no creative is the variable to success, as Gary would say but you can't argue speed and price, right? So, so if I tell you it's Thursday and it's $50,000, uh, what I delivered to you Thursday for $50,000, we made debate. It could be subjective. I think it's good, you don't think it's good, you, I think it's red, you think it should be blue, but you won't argue that it's showing up on Thursday and that it costs 50 grand, the, you know? So, you know, speed and price are, are speed and value, really, not price, but speed and value are what we pride ourselves on here. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. And I mean, keep, keeping that promise of, hey, it's going to be one of the most profitable offerings, one of the most profitable things to come out of VaynerMedia. I mean, how do you take, so you have the Sasha group, right? It's not VaynerMedia. I guess you have... Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk flying in to meet at 4Ds sometimes, right? How do you take such a strong personal brand that people might be doing business with you for the reason of that personal brand, right? And separate the two company, separate the company from the personal brand. And I feel like a lot of accountants out there have to be um, conscious of how they're building their personal brand with their firm behind them. Um, and I think, you know, some, I, I know some, individuals out there some of our clients were working on that but um how do you how do you see that for you know the sasha group look you can't underestimate the power of brand right it's it's one of the things that i really learned when i worked at interbrand which was at the time the world's largest agency for branding right and they had a proprietary methodology called brand valuation which helped to calculate the intangible of a brand right mm makes Ford pay $2 billion for a tired old brand like Jaguar when the assets were probably worth 200 million and it's the intangible of the brand. I'm looking at this board up here because you can see somebody wrote this posted uh, branding versus sales. Okay, there's two different things. So, um, you know, building a brand takes time, 
but will result in better sales, higher prices for for the the product right think of think of all the branding that went into tide you can buy detergent for one third the price of tide yet it's it's the number one selling detergent you know in, in the country if not the world um and that's that's a lot to do with the branding that went behind it so um uh, you know brand is vitally important which is why our logo says the sasha group a Vaynerx company. We're not straying too far from the mothership and the brand. We know where it is. When Gary said, hey, James, you're going to be the CEO, I said, no, Gary, you should be the CEO. You're who's on the cover of the magazine that they all want to be like. I'll be the president. I'll help you run the company as president, but I don't need the title to be CEO. Mm -hmm. I know all about brand and, and how to, how to you know, leverage it for success. Very, very interesting. Yeah, so I want to touch on speed real quick. What are some of the things that, um, you know, I, I, I know that VaynerMedia really, you know, prides itself on speed, right, and execution with the way that there, there was a brand I was looking at that VaynerMedia was uh, handling, and it was a fairly large brand, and I was just kind of wowed by the speed. I mean, people were texting people from the client, um, <laughs> Im images back and forth, the decisions were being made, right? I think it was... Uh, a whip cream or Mir miracle, yeah, whip. Miracle, miracle whip. Miracle whip. It was miracle whip. Um, yeah. can, you, can you speak a little bit about that yeah. client relationship of speed and making decisions like that? Yes. Yeah, so that was uh, that was interesting. That was a brand that was suffering a quarter over quarter sales decline for multiple years, right? And they came to us and said, "Hey, is there is there anything you could do with with this particular brand?" And uh, uh, we uh, applied our Vayner volume method, um, where you know, the, the premise is Gary believes that uh, the internet is limitless, right? So, so you, you'll hear him say market for the year in which you live, right? Market for the year in which we're in. So um, uh, back in the day when there was only a 30 second television commercial, you had to create an artful story in that 30 seconds because you only had 30 seconds. Right or or a sixty page magazine. There's only sixty pages. My pages got to be artistic in order to stick out. Well, the internet is limitless, right? It doesn't have to end at thirty seconds. Take forty two seconds to tell the story, um, and and uh, you know it's not just about one page in a magazine. You could have multiple posts that you could put up at a time. So it's more about pushing out as much content as you can and seeing how the consumer interacts with the content. Interesting. Work the Vayner volume method for. Uh, um, um, for uh, Miracle Whip, we were trying to test different things on, on uh, Twitter to see exactly what was resonating with the audience. And, you know, it wasn't so much about the sandwich spread or the fact that it was, you know, a salad dressing. Uh, what resonated was the fact that it was the anti-mayo. Um, that's what the consumers latched onto. So we began to play with that and, and tell the story more and see more interactions on social, which then led to, uh, you know, a, a larger video production, you know, around that same uh, anti-Mayo premise, um, which eventually led to the rebranding of Mayo Florida as Miracle Whip Florida, right? The anti-Mayo. What better thing than to rename a town that? Uh, which right. got Coverage, you know, a front page of USA Today and CNBC and so many other news uh, outlets picked it up. Um, people began to drive out of their way to get to Miracle Whip, Florida, just to take pictures in front of the water tower that was renamed or the fire department that was renamed. So, uh, yeah, how, how VaynerX could do it differently is because the creative is yoked to the media, which is yoked to the video production department. Uh, it's all under one roof. It all reports to one CEO. It's one bottom line. Um, it's it's not a pass off. Think think of the fact that the guy who runs the four hundred meter race has a faster time than the four guys that run the four by four. They're both four hundred meters, but they have to slow down each time to pass the baton. So the time is is faster if you're just running the race and you know uh, yourself. And that's what Vayner. We run the race ourselves. We're not passing off between companies uh, and different different resources. It's all here under one umbrella. Nice, nice. And yeah, so you you I mean you're familiar with um, the Omnicom model and people that are or companies that are Omnicom companies, right? 
I mean, um, what can you speak to about uh, creative freedom? Because me personally, I love, I love clients and entrepreneurial accountants and CPAs that come to me and say, Juan, I mean, you're, you're the marketer, right? Um, what should we do? We're trusting you here versus um, clients that are like, you know, are we sure? Are you sure we should be doing this one? Um, and kind of too, too unsure, right? So can you speak to some of that creative freedom and even how, even if VaynerMedia, I know for the Fortune 500s, um, they might give some pushback to certain creative ideas. Is that right? Yeah, it's clear. I mean, you know, why we are so successful here is first and foremost, the end game from Gary, and everybody knows this, is he wants to buy the Jets, right? Mm -hmm. So we're working backwards from his ability to, to multiple billions of dollars to buy the Jets. Um, so what he built here was really his own test lab. He's not going to buy the Jets by selling VaynerMedia to a holding company like WPP or Omnicom or Interpublic. Um, his desire is to eventually buy orphaned or abandoned brands, right, uh, and, and run them through this marketing machine and increase the value of that brand and then flip those brands. Right. right? So, so the beauty of Vayner, VaynerMedia and VaynerX is the fact that we don't ask any client to do what it is that Gary isn't already doing for himself. Right? It's, it's, Perfect. it's already game over. Like we're, we're asking you to do it because we know it works because Gary tried it on himself first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, real, real quick, real quick, real quick. Um, I noticed that Gary Vaynerchuk also released his uh, audio tag and he's posting these things called audio tags on his uh, Instagram now. It's just, it's just a little, it's a sonic tag, I think he calls it. And it's a little sound, right? And one of my clients was like, um, can you make this for us, right? Can, you, can we just use one of these sonic tags? And I was like, sure, um, I'm, I'll actually make it for you, but I'm going to make it for uh, myself first, for our company first, so we can just say that, well, we, we have done it before our clients, right? And so, yeah, I'm very familiar with um, not advising people to do things that you haven't done or wouldn't do, so. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's another perfect thing. I mean, we had a whole division at Interbrand that did sonic branding. You know, what is the sound when you boot up Windows? So what is my, my Samsung sound like when I turn on and get my AT&T service? You know, sonic branding is, is very important. You know, Gary's doubling down on, on the voice side of things as well. Um, so, uh, and he does believe that we are all brands, right? Um, I mean, you, you, you said, Hey, you must've done a couple of, uh, of podcasts. Yeah. The fact of the matter is you're my 16th that I've done, you know, in the last, you know, uh, 14 months probably. So, um, uh, yeah, we're all working on our personal brand as well. You know, when I, when I went to work for Cedo mobile, most people, my brand was actually bigger than the Cedo mobile brand. In, in uh, I'll never forget Mobile Marketer Magazine on, uh, on the front cover said, what makes James Orsini leave his comfortable perch at Saatchi to go to work for Cedo, you know? So, um, yeah, we're Amazing. personal brands. You know, it was Gary's personal brand, uh, you know, was, was sh stronger than and led to the success of VaynerMedia. Interesting, interesting. And James, I actually have an interesting question for you here to – just uh, pick your brain a little bit on the marketing side and accounting side. I mean, we don't have to get into, is it KPMG or is it PWC? But if you were, you know, you were advising one of the big four, I don't know if you do, what, what could they do better when it comes to marketing? Because um, I, I let my thoughts out there on what PWC should do because I've actually internally, when I did work there, I did advise them and their US marketing director um, so much so that the room got quiet and they shook their heads and they were like, you're right. We haven't posted on Instagram in five days. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, just from what you're looking at, if you were, <laughs> if they were a client of yours, right. What would you do different? Lee? Yeah, I think it's uh, so first of all, they're all great brands. KPMG, Ernst and Young, PWC, Deloitte, they're all fabulous, fabulous brands, uh, that, that, uh, stand on their own equity. Uh, some of what I like that KPMG is doing is it's engaging alumni and it's featuring the people. So 
know, if, if you look at the KPMG alumni website or, or what have you, uh, their ability to, 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 to feature what's happening um, is important. What can they do better? They can stay even closer to their alumni because let's face it, not everybody goes out to become a partner in one of those big firms and they're out and about, um, you know, and uh, I know, you know, when, when I was in the Saatchi world and KPMG was our auditors, uh, you know, and then I went to Omnicom, I got a call from them who said, listen, we're going to be pitching the Omnicom business and anything that you could do to, you know, um, um, put in a good word would be nice. Uh, you know, now obviously I wasn't the guy making the decision at the Omnicom level, but I did let them know like, hey, for what it's worth, I worked there and they, they were great auditors for us when I was at uh, Saatchi. So, you know, take that for what you want. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, that whole... Uh, brand affiliation and, and uh, you know, leveraging others in, uh, uh, in, in that sphere of influence, trusted advisor um, kind, of, uh, kind of branding, but producing the content. You know, it's rare that I see a lot of the partners in those bigger firms featured. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's almost like um, the, the, the companies are not, personalized their their sterile corporate images off to the to and afar mm -hmm. and, and and really what is those companies other than the people that are in them so if you're a service sector company you have to find a way to feature rally around and feature your people remember what i said uh, about mm -hmm. insurance brokers right they all found their swim lane mm -hmm. One was comfortable in podcasting, one was comfortable in video, and one was comfortable in writing. Uh, so they explain, and together they make up that great insurance company. Yeah, and that, that's that last part. Um, that's exactly what Gary told me when I asked him, you know, how can accountants make just more media, more that, that volume of content, <laughs> right? He said, well, Juan, I mean, the way you're talking to me, I understand you're charismatic, right? I would, I would rather not have my accountant be as charismatic as you. And I know most of, most of the market is not like that, right? So what they need to do is use what they do best, whether that's writing an article, whether that's audio from one of their meetings, right? Or whether that's mm -hmm. actually, actually getting in front of the camera, right? No. So I think, you know, everyone should just do what they do best, right? But then how do they kind of extrapolate that um, into making that very powerful, right? So what I'm saying here is you may think that you cannot win if you're not charismatic, right? But I mean, if you've been listening to James here, he's not as charismatic as Gary Vaynerchuk, yet he's a legendary marketer, right? So what do you have to say to some of these, I guess, partners out there who when you tell them you need, they hear they, that they need to market, they say, well, I'm not going to get out there. It, I mean, I mean, you mentioned the, the cartoon, right? So that's, that's extremely interesting, but what would you just say to, towards some of the psychology in their, in their heads, right? The way they're thinking about things. Look, if you're going to play to their psychology, um, I would then ask them, so what's your, what's your elevator pitch, right? Gary asked me when he interviewed me, describe what you do in one sentence. And I said, I take dreams and visions and I make them into action plans. And he said, great, you're hired. I got a lot of dreams and visions. Awesome. So um, what stops somebody to say, hey, we saved our clients combined $50 million in taxes in, in 2017 alone. Uh, we helped our clients uh, get uh, 150 million in financing in the first six months of 2019. You know, big, broad headlines that make people stop and say, "Wow, I, I need that." Uh, you know, I need tax savings advice. Uh, you know, I, I need financing. You know, let me let me see how these guys can help us. We we've served up. Oh, think think of the uh, McDonald's, right? Over a billion served. We've served up over 650 clean audits in the last 24 months. You know, something that's compelling that you can hang a hat on that will stop somebody in, uh, in their tracks because th that spoke to them. That is what they need at that moment in time. I think that's how 
accountants can stay in their swim lane and be a little more comfortable. Stick with the facts. Right. Yeah. Telling, telling the truth. That's the, that's the best way to market. And so, um, I think, uh, also, man, this, this reminds me because I just had an inquiry, um, of an accounting firm and I really won't say who it is this time, but when I looked up their firm, they had, you know, and I'm not going to do business with them by the way, audience, but they had nothing but bad reviews online and, you know, they didn't get back to clients. They, they were, suing their clients and a, this was you know they had a lot of bad reviews this is not <laughs> this is not um, a client that I'm gonna make look good by marketing right mm -hmm. but on the flip side if um, people are good and they are saving million their clients millions in taxes doing such a great job right coming out and saying something like that sure what, what James Orsini just said sure it's gonna work right but I also think that people worry about getting themselves into a PR disaster or PR nightmare, right? Especially in the accounting space. Um, so how does the Sasha Group, how does VaynerMedia look at these things online that could possibly be a PR nightmare, right? So, you know, Gary often says doing the right thing is always the right thing. And starting from a position of truth um, you know, where you don't have to wear multiple hats because, you know, you, you've made an improper claim that you can't live up to. Uh, remember, in, in advertising, we're governed by the, uh, the uh, uh, FTC and, and it's, uh, you know, uh, there's claims and liabilities and you can't make false claims and, you know, there needs to be research if you're going to say you're the best in a particular category. So, you know, we're cautious about that. The clients have got to show up before we put it out there. Um, uh, but, but that said, you know, um, one of the easiest things for an accounting firm to do is to get, get some testimonials, right? So, so why isn't my accounting firm calling me, uh, and asking me for a testimony they could put on their website, mm -hmm. uh, gladly do it. All they got to do is ask. I'm not going to solicit them to tell them I want to do it, but right. about it. Right. So. So how was the mentors program so successful? Because our first three guys gave us film testimonies that we then sent around, became our case studies. Um, you know, I didn't have to say, because people ask me, have you ever done this, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, for insurance? And I said, no, I haven't, but uh, let me show you what I have done. And you're willing to speak to those guys if you have to. Uh, you know, and, and the, the insurance guy did speak to the nail polish manufacturing guy. Uh, to just see what it was like working with us. So I think that's an easy thing for CPA firms to do. Just get some people to, to really give a sincere and genuine testimony uh, for the services that you've provided them and why they keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, com I completely agree. And by the way, audience, if you can get them on a Zoom call and do like a Zoom testimonial, that'll be even better than... Um, I mean, you know, you know, audit, right? Well, what evidence do you listen to? The evidence on the site, right? So I don't necessarily want just a quote, but it would be really nice if I had that testimonial vid video from the actual client, from the source, right? So um, James, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, but um, here, here's one of the last questions if this doesn't lead to more. But uh, myself, I mean, just learning from Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, going, executing the model of patience, executing the model of moving fast on the day to day, but long term. And I think, you know, this is such an accounting thing because it's such a CFO thing to map out a chess match. It takes so long to just finally, you know, put them in checkmate, right? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, sports is, are big to me too. I'm a big Joe Montana fan. And by the way, James has been very cool like cool, cool Joe Montana on this interview, such a nice demeanor here. Um, but I'm a big Joe Montana fan, but Ronnie Lott, 42 years out, Ronnie Lott, 42. That's what I'm playing for 42 years out. What is James Orsini playing for and how far out speak to that? Well, look, I'm, I'm excited that Gary gave me the opportunity here, uh, to start something new and, and really, Really, uh, he's got a big vision for this uh, um, subsidiary here in the Sasha Group. Um, you know, a lofty vision targeting a $100 million company in four years. 
so yeah, uh, you know, I'm I'm honored to have a role in this. I mean, typically, uh, uh, you know, in in an industry that typically uh, exits uh, guys at uh, at uh, 55 plus, uh, you know, to have a chance to pivot and and do it again uh, is something I'm really excited about, and I'm I'm here for as long as Gary needs me to be here. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I made a promise to him that I will help him achieve his dreams and visions. Uh, and this is another one that he now has. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to having this be a successful uh, offering within the VaynerX portfolio. Love it. Love it, James. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, that is it. Thank you, Juan. Hope your audience enjoys it.